Great. Well, thank you so much for having me uh, today. I'm very excited to be here and have made a couple or at least one edit to the talk as a result of, of what I've seen. So hopefully it uh, meshes together. Um, in, the, in the title, it's been advertised as just on expressive robotic systems, which is very academic and official sounding. But the, the parenthetical expression there is important to me um, because, and, and it came up last night if you went to the Rodney Brooks entrepreneurship dinner, um, he warned the government officials at the dinner that if they don't support with funding um, robotic development, they'll end up with only, and this is a loose quote, little dancing robots. Um, and so I think that we, we tend to um, attribute that as trivial and frivolous. And, and my hope with this talk is to sort of highlight how it's not just trivial and frivolous, and that there's a duality between function and expression. Um, so, and, and expression has come up a lot today, and expressivity and expressiveness. And so that's exactly where my talk starts um, in thinking about what is expressivity. And so here are some figures I've pulled from some IEEE, ACM type publications that highlight expressive um, or effective motion. And in both of these figures, you have some artifact of motion on the left in just a trajectory over time and on the right in these little simple skeletons. And a commonality between these two papers is the, is the idea that some motion is happy and some motion is sad, and that this is what expressive motion is. And so I just I'll present that with a question mark for now. Um, here would be another question for me, right? These snake robots, which are sort of like the height of utilitarian, like drive through pipes and clean stuff and do functional work, are these robots expressive? I'll leave that with a question mark as well. Um, in my lab, we explore this idea of expressivity uh, through this exact mode. Um, so these are three snapshots from, from workshops and uh, activities in my lab. And we're exploring not just by looking at motion and trying to label it, but really experiencing it in our own bodies and understanding how um, motion is meaningful to humans and situated contexts. So coming from this point of view, so maybe a better cartoon of this point of view, right, is a choreographer standing in front of a group, in front of, a group of dancers and trying to communicate some motion uh, commands or profiles or ideas to this group of people. And I want to take my choreographer, my dancer, and I'm going to use him for a little uh, cartoon demonstration. So he, he's an agent, and in his task is the classic robotics task, get from point A to point B. And um, OK, so let's, let's see how he'll do that. He'll walk freely, expressing himself in nature, maybe, to get from point A to point B. Without any other constraints, the choreographer, I think we can agree, or the agent can just walk freely to get from point A to point B. So now I'm going to ask the choreographer to get from point A to point B in the presence of a friend. So now I have two agents. One is viewing the, the motion of the first agent. And often this is considered like needed for the idea of expressivity to make sense. And so let's see how that changes the task. So now the agent is going to walk and, and just try to look cool for its friend, right? And so maybe the task has changed a little bit. I don't know, if it, if, is this expressive motion? We're trying to heat the task up a little, and I'm going to make it come more complicated. Now I'm doing this in a particular environment. So now the agent needs to get from point A to point B across this living room. And he's going to do so in the presence of a friend. And so now the motion required to solve the problem or to solve the task is a little more complex. It tries not to look stupid and avoids couches. Um, and now, and this is where, this is like, we feel like we might be expressive motion with needing expressive motion to solve this task, right? Get from point A to point B in the living room while communicating to your friend that you're angry. And so here, I, 
uh, I will posit that the agent needs to thrash its arms wildly, shaking them, slashing them in the air, and walking with thick, heavy, sure-footed steps. And in that motion, we'll express to the friend that the agent is angry. Do we agree? I feel that everyone in this room is like more artists than my typical audience, which is more roboticists, and you smell that something is afoot, which is, <laughs> which is fair. OK, so now we're going to do the same series of tasks in the jungle. My task is just get from point A to point B in the new context of a jungle. And in this jungle, the underbrush is thick and heavy and dense, and to get through the underbrush from point A to point B, the agent needs to thrash its arms wildly, slash them at the air, stomp its feet with heavy, sure-footed steps, just to get from point A to point B. And if I add the friend back into the mix, right, uh, now I have a human observer watching this action in the jungle, it no longer, I would argue, communicates anger to the friend. Just this functional task of getting from point A to point B is seen as that, right? Is seen as a functional behavior that's needed to get through the jungle. And I no longer think my friend is angry uh, just because of this, this motion profile. So I've set up two, two contexts with the same motion profile. In one case, the motion looks angry. In another case, the motion doesn't look angry. And um, it kind of puts a wrench in the original description of what expressive motion is, right? Is that all of a sudden, as we look across variable contexts, this idea of happy motion and sad motion really breaks down. Um, and this is discussed a lot in Laban Barteniev movement studies, which is a uh, method of working that um, I have studied for years and, and that my group studies as well. And in this system, they talk about function and expression of movement quite formally. And rather than saying some motion is functional and some motion is expressive or some, it, it's really talked about as a duality, that all motion is expressive, all motion is functional. And, and this model of a Mobius strip uh, tries to model that duality, that the more expressive something is, the more functional it may be, and the more functional, the more expressive. So we can't divide these two things, and so, from my training anyway. And so what we might say instead is that we think of these movers as a particularly expressive, right? We use that colloquially all the time. And I think for me, for this word to be meaningful and, and quantitative, I have to think of this as a function of, of these movers and of this moving platform. And they're not expressive then for what they're doing, but for all the great number of things that they can do. And, and this is consistent with the way dancers think about their training, right? They go to class in order to broaden the palette of options that they have in their movement. And so I'm going to use this word expressive to talk about a particular platform, not a particular movement or behavior. And in doing that, uh, I can try to understand how expressive various robots are. And so to do that, I'm going to present these three slides. This is where I usually jump around and move, but I'll try to stay with the microphone. On the first plot, all the way on your left, what I've done is taken a variety of uh, robotic platforms over the last 15 years, and I've plotted the number of transistors in the onboard computer of each robot. And this is kind of a limiting picture of robots because most of the time now we, we have them connected to another computer or even the whole internet. And um, so it's a bit of a limiting picture, but it gives me a, a point of comparison that I want to make in a second. And, and this is the same kind of plot, this left-hand plot, that revealed Moore's Law many years ago, right? They were counting up the number of uh, transistors on a single chip, and this continued growth has made for very, very practical and very useful computers. Right? A, you know, a 1964 computer can do many of the same operations as a computer today, but the computers today with this additional power are much more practically useful. In the middle plot, I'm taking the same robots and I'm counting up the mechanical configurations available to them. And we could think about this as like the transistors are some measure of the internal states of the robot and this mechanical measure is some measure of the external states of the robot. And I'm just counting up the number of shapes. 
And so to compare the first graph on your left to the middle graph, these y-axes, the x-axes are the same, but the y-axes are slightly different, right? The number of transistors, to get the number of configurations internal to the machine, I have to go 2 to the 10 to the 7th to get that number. So there's quite an imbalance between the two. And so to, to balance those out, what I'll do is just take the log base in base 2 of the mechanical configuration. So now I have the same kinds of numbers between the two, and I'll plot them on the same graph. That's what's in the third plot, all the way on the right. And I've used square axes just so you can see this, this kind of imbalance that happens, right? So on the y-axis, I have my computational configurations in base 2, um, or number of transistors. And that shows quite a dramatic increase over the last 15 years of how many onboard transistors these robots have. On the y-axis, I have the number of shapes uh, in log base 2. And so that number has actually stayed quite flat. And so in, if we're thinking of expressivity as the number of different shapes a robot can make, there's quite a flat trend. The other thing that I can do now is say, how could I compare this to a biological system? And this is, there's a lot on this plot, and uh, I'm going to basically not talk about every detail. But what we can point to are these two black circles. Um, and on these black circles, I have used a very robust, well-established model of C. elegant motion to generate these points. And so C. elegans are a model organism. We know that they have 302 neurons. So the neuron count is going to be my x-axis point. And for my y-axis point, I use the number of join angles uh, or the number of parameters that are needed to specify the motion of this L C. elegans. There's two numbers because it's complicated about why there's two numbers. I particularly think that the top number is more important, but we could talk about this more offline. The point is there's two models. And if I put them on the plot, robots tend to fit somewhere in between those two models, a more expressive model or a more simplified model. But somewhere in between there is where all these robots that I've plotted over the years. And so if we think about robots as mirrors uh, for, our, for, for the natural world, it's probably, I would argue, more apt to think of them as mirrors, at least externally, as mirrors for something like a C. elegans than for something like a human. Um, and, and I loved the example from earlier uh, of Ingrid's robots. And so I just thought, and, and in the I, spirit of thinking about soft robots, so all the robots I analyzed for these plots are these rigid um, traditional uh, linkages with servo motors in between. If we took the, the, the robot of Ingrid's that didn't move, so it would have one shape available to it. So it would be all the way at the bottom of this y-axis plot. And I'm going to assume she had no computer inside, but there's probably a bad assumption, so that would put it all the way over on the y-axis. And then when you add this soft covering, even for the robot that didn't move, that robot moved, right? Because the wind blew the soft things and people perceived something inside that. So I think that's an interesting, I mean, I don't know exactly where it should fit, but I thought that was an interesting point, data point. And what we find in my lab is that artists and working as ourselves as artists um, really test and push the expressivity of systems. And so this is a, a place that is really originally what got me interested in robotics. Um, coming at, from a background in dance, I was really curious how I would describe two different styles of movement. And so that's been part of my engineering practice for a long time. Um, as a robotics researcher, I've also looked at this uh, inside several performances. This was uh, a snapshot from a performance, a live performance that accompanied my PhD dissertation. And, in working with these artists in that, at the same time as writing my dissertation, it was a, a really rich place to discuss and talk about critically these models for style that I had developed. Um, I, I've worked a little bit with uh, artists in Charlottesville when I was a faculty member there, um, thinking about how we could design a set of movement instructions for a particular location in space. And so this is really leveraging you know, quantitative models of motion to produce a particular site-specific work. Um, a collaborative work with uh, a dance faculty member, Kim Brooks Mata at UVA, we actually used motion capture data of humans. And what's interesting about that little stick figure is it has about, if I'm generous, 100 numbers that associate uh, the pose of a human, which is very similar to the C. elegant model, actually. Um, 
Maybe, see, maybe humans are only as complex as C. elegans, I don't, I don't know. Um, and then more recently, and what I'll talk about in my um, lightning talk is a little bit about the merging of research themes and artistic themes inside an ongoing work with my lab's artist in residence, uh, Katie Kwan. And I just want to sum up with a few, like some three super, super packed slides about different projects in my group uh, and how they fit into this kind of like iterative design cycle where we have some system that we're trying to build, this expressive robotic system that can demonstrate a wide variety of movement behaviors rather than one single repetitive behavior, um, and how we work collaboratively with, with artists and with certified movement analysts uh, to do this. So in one project, we're trying to think about developing expressive uh, bipedal robots that walk with a greater variety of gates than current robots walk with. Um, and the way we've done this is really by walking around the lab. So that's where my little design cycle starts. Um, and, and in embodying particular exercises that, uh, that, that uh, Ermgard Barteniev uh, enumerated to describe how she experienced walking. And then through that, we design the 3D robot, and then we simplify that 3D robot to something that's easier to control. And then we can produce variable gates, not just a walk, but a, what we're calling a stagger and a skim and an amble. And the way we develop those labels is by showing the movement to a certified movement analyst, having her feedback, deciding, is there six gates here? Are there four gates here? Is there 19 gates here? Right? We computationally can come up with about 258. All of those are probably not perceptually meaningful to humans, so we start with this smaller number. And then we show them to people on Amazon Turk, see what they think, um, and we do this for across a variety of backgrounds and see how that changes their perception of the gate. In another project, we're looking at in-home robots to assist the elderly. And there, again, and this is actually kind of like two linear cycles that meet up, so one moving from the left and one moving from the right. Um, it's a similar process where we're developing some artificial motion profile, showing it to an expert in human uh, movement analysis, and, and asking them to notate what they see. If we're not happy with that result, we go back, we change the quantitative algorithm, we cycle through that kind of repetitive process, then we show it to lay viewers for, for further validation. Um, on the other hand, I have a current student who was obsessed with the idea of putting together actually a robot opera. So the last talk he would, he would have loved. And he had this big lofty idea that he was going to do Tristan and Isolde. And, and I, I think that was really important for him because it gave him this expressive goal, right? This high thing that he, and in order to get to that point or even close to that point, he had to append these mobile robots with additional degrees of freedom that augment the expressiveness of them. And, allow for more dramatic characters to be created. And so this has resulted, um, again, where we show this to live audiences and, and human subjects types audiences to try and, and learn what people are seeing as well. And finally, in another project, we're thinking about how do we create the same motion on many different platforms. Uh, so I loved Petra's video from that point of view, right? She's, she's doing this in sort of the opposite way that we're doing it. She's crawling inside these strange shapes to try and make um, meaningful motion from her body to theirs. And what we're doing is saying, okay, if I can create a motif or a, a high-level uh, description of a particular human motion sequence, how do I translate that onto different platforms? And um, then can I validate that with human viewers? And do human viewers agree that these two movements are the same? the human actor, and then the robot. And we've also tried to, this approach with just using motion capture data. So the bottom uh, slide of arrows is, is using motion capture data to generate two robots, one more expressive than the other. One just has a single degree of freedom, one has two. And asking people, are these two things the same? Again, um, to try and understand how do you take this large dimensional, what I think is quite high dimensional signal of human motion, um, and, and put it on a, a low-dimensional robot. And any robot I pick is going to probably be pretty low-dimensional relative to the original human behavior. So and I want to thank my group, of course. This is only a random, a somewhat by now, a scattering of, of 
the people who've done this work.